We'll turn with me again to Revelation 6. Billy Graham calls this the approaching hoofbeats. Bailey Smith calls it the rodeo after the rapture. John Wolverd calls it the beginning of the great day of God's wrath. And I'm calling it the horses of horror. Now, folks, I usually have a fairly positive outlook on life. I am more of an optimist than a pessimist. But the period of time that we are going to be talking about tonight is not going to be very positive. It's going to be one of the most negative periods of history this world has ever seen. The Lamb who is worthy is going to begin to open the title deed to the earth. And he is going to break those seals. And as he does, the wrath of God is going to be poured out on the inhabitants of this world. And unlike those who hold the pre-wrath view, I believe all of this is the wrath of God. Now we're going to see another significant shift of scenes here in Revelation 6. We're going to move now back from heaven to the earth. Actually, what we're going to see here is that what happens in heaven has a direct and very drastic impact on what happens on the earth. As the seals are opened in heaven, terrible things begin to take place upon the earth. But you remember in chapter 5, John is introduced to the seven-sealed book or scroll that has now been placed into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in chapter 6, we're going to witness the opening of the first six seals of that scroll. The opening of each seal ushers in a different judgment that will fall on those who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The first four of these are described in the terms of horsemen who will ride on their horses and carry out the judgment of God. This is the beginning of what most people call the tribulation period. It is the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30 verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great, there is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. Now the King James has Jacob's trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble. And that, by the way, applies to Israel. Turn with me for a moment to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Now, at some point, we may walk through the Olivet Discourse uh, in detail. But for now, notice with me verse 21. Matthew 24, and look at verse 21. It says, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. That's what's being described here with the opening of the seals. This is going to be the worst time in the history of the world. That's what the Bible says. You know, this tired old planet has come under many cruel times of bloodshed, famine, catastrophe, dictatorships, many other causes of human suffering. But the sixth chapter of Revelation introduces the most brutal time of suffering that this world has ever known. And what we're going to see, of course, is that chapters 6 through 19 describe the judgment that God is going to bring in three waves. We're going to see seven seals followed by seven trumpets, followed by seven bowls of wrath. 
And each of these is going to get progressively worse and more severe. So with that in mind, let's read again the first eight verses of chapter 6, because these are describing the four horsemen. And I saw when the lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. And when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come. And another red horse went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth and that men should slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, come. And I looked and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. And when he broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come. And I looked and behold, an ashen horse and he who sat on it had the name death and Hades was following after, with him. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. What an awesome day this is going to be. So let's look at these four horses and their riders. First of all, we have the white horse. Jesus opens the first seal and one of the four living creatures says, come, come. Actually, it is more likely that that means go. The command was the signal for the horsemen to ride dramatically across the stage of human history. Verse 2 says, And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, what is this white horse all about? Who is this one who is riding on this white horse? It is very important that we properly identify this rider because he is the key to understanding all the rest. Does this white horse represent Christ? Well, in Revelation 19, we're told that Jesus Christ will be riding on a white horse. Is that what this is talking about? No. In Revelation 19, we're told that Christ will have a crown upon his head, just like this writer does. However, the two words for crown are different. In Revelation 19, it is the word diadema, which is the crown of royalty. But here, it is the word stephanos, which is the victor's crown. This rider is not Christ, it is Antichrist. A deeper look reveals his true nature. He is a conqueror bent on conquest, as the New International Version has it. In other words, he is greedily riding roughshod over all who stand in his way in his lust for power. This is none other than the little horn of Daniel 7, 8 and chapter 8, verse 9. It is the lawless one of 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 that Bible students have been anticipating for centuries. This is the one who will come masquerading as Christ. And he will come saying, peace, peace. And he will offer a plan for world peace, which will include, I believe, solving the Middle East crisis. But do you remember the warning of 1 Thessalonians 5.3? It says, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs 
upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. This false Christ, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 12, is known as the man of sin, the covenant-making covenant prince of Daniel 9, 26. He will make a covenant that will seem to bring peace to the world, but as soon as he has conquered the world at the midpoint of the seven-year period, he will break his covenant and there will be anything but peace. Now you say, how do you, how do you know, preacher, that this is not Christ here? Well, we know this for several reasons. First, Christ is in heaven opening the seals and therefore could not be the rider on the horse at the same time. Secondly, the four horsemen are a unity, all symbolizing the spread of evil in the world and its effects. Third, the triumph of God in Christ does not come until the long series of God's judgments are poured out and the balance of the vision takes place. And we need to remember that a white horse can symbolize victory of any kind, whether good or bad. This is evil conquering. This is the Antichrist conquering, and yet we know it accomplishes God's sovereign purpose. And one of the most important aspects of the tribulation period is the, the satanic world leader who is going to take over the rule of the nations of the earth during the seven-year period. The apostle John wrote in 1 John 2, 8, just as you heard, Antichrist is coming. How had they heard that? Well, they had heard because this is clearly foretold in the Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament prophets had clearly predicted that there would be a final satanic world leader in the final days of the history of the world. And this teaching was reiterated by Jesus himself in his earthly ministry. And it was re-emphasized by the apostles, the ones who were sent by Jesus to preach and teach. And truly, the early church had heard many times that Antichrist would eventually come. My friend, you can mark it down. There is coming a man who will one day rule every nation on this earth. The Bible says he will devour the whole world under his rule. There will be a one world government and he will be at its head but praise God, it won't last long. The Bible says that all of this unification and false peace is only going to last a few years, and then it will end in a world war called Armageddon. And all the nations that exist for a while under this worldwide confederacy and are at peace for a short period of time will eventually fill the valley of Megiddo with their blood as high as the horse's bridles. And of course, that will be at the hand of the other one who will be on a white horse, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will be the one who will wear the true crown, the royal diadem as the king of kings. But back to this white horse and its rider, the white horse in the early days of the tribulation period symbolizes conquest. The conquering Antichrist will carry a warrior's bow. But notice something interesting here. He has a bow, but there's no mention of any arrows. Why is that? Well, I can't be dogmatic here because the text doesn't actually say this, but I believe this is pointing to the fact that he is going to come into power without a single shot being fired. 
How is he going to do that? He is going to convince the world that he is a great man of peace. He is going to conquer through diplomacy rather than war. He is going to promise this great peace in the world, and he's going to do, I believe, what no man has ever been able to do. He is going to solve the Middle East crisis. He is going to come as a political superman, solving all the world's problems. Maybe he'll come up with a cure for cancer. Maybe he'll do some other amazing thing. Uh, Perhaps he'll get all the factions in the Muslim countries to lay down their arms and stop threatening the world with terror. But he's going to be a great man of peace, even though secretly he is really going to be a man of war. And by the way, that's how Satan works, isn't it? His deceptions always look different from what they actually are. He promises pleasure. He promises happiness, bliss. But it never works out that way, does it? Because he is the father of lies. You know, a man doesn't go out one night and say, you know, I think I'll get drunk and get in my car and have a head-on collision and kill some innocent family. No, he doesn't say that. He says, I want to have a good time, and so I'm going to go out and party for a while. But he may get in his car and kill an innocent family. A young couple doesn't say, you know, we want to bring in an unwanted child into this world that will be neglected and abused. No, they say, we're going to have a moment of passion and pleasure. And by the way, the Antichrist is not going to come as a man of war, but will masquerade as an angel of light. He is the great deceiver. He will be viewed as the world's savior, but he will be a Trojan horse, its greatest possible curse. You remember what 2 Corinthians 11, 14 says about Satan and his tactics? It says that he will come in as an angel of light. He will come in such a way that the whole world will embrace him and gladly put him in power. And think about this for a moment. He could be alive on the earth right now. He could be someone who is currently living. Now, we don't know that he is, but we don't know that he isn't. He could already be saddled up and ready to ride, awaiting the command of the heavenly being. I mean, consider these passages of Scripture. John 5, 43 says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another shall come in his own name, you will receive him. That verse can apply to a charlatan of any age, but especially to this deceiver of all deceivers who will come in the last days. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 11 and 12 says, And for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who do not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. This is in the context of the coming of Antichrist. People are going to believe this man and they're going to follow him because God is going to send a deluding influence upon them. This will be part of their judicial hardening. And because they have hardened their hearts against the truth, God is going to judge them by hardening their hearts even further to the place where they can no longer discern truth from error, and so they will buy into this man of sin. And folks, we could very well be on the way to that. I I really believe we already have a reprobate mind in this country. 
I mean, it's insane what is happening. As people are not even able to reason, it doesn't seem anymore. And common sense is completely gone. Now, do you remember the vision that Daniel had in Daniel chapter 2? Turn with me to Daniel 2 for just a moment. Daniel chapter 2. Now, I'm sure you know that this dream of King Nebuchadnezzar is a prophetic vision from God, and it is a panoramic view of the history of the world. And we're not going to go through it tonight in detail, but the head of gold in verses 36 through 38 represents the kingdom of Babylon. The chest and arms of silver in verse 39 is the Medo-Persian empire. The thighs of bronze represent the kingdom of Greece under Alexander the Great. And the goat's broken horn, which became four horns, pictures the four generals who divided Alexander's kingdom when he died. The legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay in verses 40 through 43 represent the fourth great world empire, which is no doubt the Roman Empire. In verse 41, it says that this fourth kingdom would be divided, and we know that the Roman Empire was divided between the east and the west. Not only that, but the Romans put their iron men in with the clay that they had conquered. In other words, they spotted Roman soldiers all throughout the empire to keep order. But the problem with this is they never really mingled and adhered together. And there were constant revolutions and skirmishes taking place all throughout the Roman empire. Now, there is an indication in Daniel 2.42 that the ten toes of the image that are smashed indicate a tenfold unity, possibly a ten-nation confederation. And this is very important to recognize because Roman, uh, Rome never had a ten-nation confederacy. So this has to be future because it, it never happened in the ancient Roman Empire. And let me just throw something else in here. Bible prophecy students used to get all excited thinking about a ten-nation confederacy in Europe. And everyone thought that the European Union was going to exist of ten nations joining together. But it ended up being more than ten nations. And that threw everybody off. Now what do we do? So what do you do with this prophecy? Well, I don't really know for sure, but perhaps it still could be end up ten nations, or it is more likely that it will be some other kind of tenfold division. There are going to be ten divisions, ten kings, if you will. Now, this tenfold division is also seen in Daniel 7. So turn with me for a moment to Daniel 7 and look at verse 7. After this, I kept looking in the night visions. Behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, And it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had, notice, ten horns. Horns in the Bible represent kingdoms or authority. Go ahead and look at verse 8. While I was contemplating the horns... Behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. 
And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. This is a picture of the Antichrist. And he's, he's going to pull up three of the kings, three horns, and he's uttering great boasts. And we'll see this uh, of the Antichrist. Drop down to verse 24. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. Now, we also see something about this confederacy in Revelation 17. So turn back over to Revelation 17 and look with me at verse 12. <clears throat> Revelation 17, 12. Here's what it says. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. This is future, isn't it? They had not yet received a kingdom when John wrote this. And I believe it is still future because this hasn't happened in history. There are still 10 future kings coming in the final form of the Roman Empire who will rule together in a tenfold confederacy of some kind. And three of the kings will be deposed by the Antichrist and he will then rule the rest of the world with the other seven. And perhaps these three will rebel against him, but he will crush them into submission. Now, someone may ask, what final Roman Empire are you talking about? What is this Roman Empire? Isn't or wasn't the Roman Empire conquered long ago? No, it wasn't. It was never completely conquered. It fell into dormancy and abeyance because of its own internal decay, but it was never fully conquered from the outside. The western half went first and was finally buried by the invasion of the northern barbarians, the Goths, Vandals, Moors, and Huns. The eastern half succumbed to the sweep of Mohammedanism and was finished off by the Turks. But even though there, was, there were external enemies, Rome fell primarily because of internal deterioration. It was never conquered. And I believe this is significant because Daniel's prophecy says that the Roman kingdom will end with a sudden smashing by the stone cut out of the mountain without hands. That's Daniel 2.45. That's not what happened to Rome. It wasn't swiftly conquered like the other kingdoms were. It suffered gradual decay, so that means this is still future. This is still talking about something that is yet to come. Now, in Daniel 7, as I said, we have the vision of the little horn that comes out of the ten horns and who conquers three horns. So who is that little horn? Well, you've probably figured it out. It's the Antichrist. Do you see where he comes from? He is going to arise out of the Ten Nation Confederacy. This horn will be little at first, but he will grow into that which is greater than all the others. And the first thing he does is to pluck up three of the other horns by their roots. In other words, he will conquer three of the nations in the confederacy and the other seven will become so fearful of him that they will succumb willingly. 
This 10 nation confederacy is going to be extremely powerful. Daniel 7, 23 says, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and it will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. Revelation 13, 7 gives a similar indication of his power. It says, and it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. This confederacy will sometime in the future rule the whole world. And out of that system is going to rise a man, Satan's man. You ask, what will he be like? Well, the Bible gives us at least six characteristics of him. He will be an intellectual genius. He will be an outstanding orator. He will be a master politician, a commercial wizard, a military genius, and a religious leader. Not only is he described as the little little horn, as we have already seen, he's also described as the king of fierce countenance. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel 8. <clears throat> now, you almost have to read this passage in the King James Version to get this, but... The King James of Daniel 8.23 reads this way. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, that is a king with an angry face, and understanding dark sentences, he'll be getting his information from the kingdom of darkness, shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, by Satan's power, according to Revelation 17, 13. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, that's Jesus Christ, of course, but he shall be broken without hand. That's, that's a, like a summary of what's going to happen to this man. In other words, he's going to be supernaturally destroyed in the end. But he's referred to here as the king of fierce countenance. And he's going to come against the holy people. That is the nation of Israel. So he's referred to here uh, in that, that sense. But he's also called the prince who is to come in Daniel 9, verses 26 and 27. So turn to Daniel 9 and look at verses 26 and 27. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of, notice, the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, what nation destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD? Rome. So if the people of the prince who is to come are Romans, he has to be a Roman, doesn't he? At least he has to come out of the revived Roman Empire. And notice verse 27, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate desolate. This prince will make a covenant with Israel, but will later violate it 
and will set himself up then to be worshiped by the whole world. And this, of course, is referred to in Scripture as the abomination of desolation. That happens exactly at the midpoint of the seven years. He's also called in Scripture the king who does as he pleases. That's Daniel 11, the king who does as he pleases. Turn with me to Daniel 11 and look at verse 16. But he who comes against him will do as he pleases, and no one will be able to withstand him. He will also stay for a time in the beautiful land, that's, of course, Israel, with destruction in his hand. He's going to come against the Jews. He's going to conquer Israel. He's going to be known as the king who does as he pleases because there is no one in the world powerful enough to stand against him. By the way, drop down to verse 36. Then the king who will do as he pleases, and he will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will speak monstrous things against the God of gods, and he will prosper until the, the indignation is finished, or that which decreed will be done, and he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god, for he will magnify himself above them all. The primary thing is he's going to be so full of pride He's going to be eaten up with himself. He's going to exalt himself. He's going to force the world to worship him. And this, of course, will lead to his downfall. Fourthly, he is referred to in Scripture as the man of lawlessness and the son of destruction. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians 2, and we'll finish with this. 2 Thessalonians 2. We begin reading in verse 1. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and, notice, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, the King James says, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Notice the phrase, man of lawlessness. Daniel tells us that he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. That's Daniel 7.25. He's going to change international laws to help him get what he wants. Therefore, he will be considered by God as the lawless one. And the phrase son of destruction or son of perdition, could be translated son of hell. And just before he exalts himself as God, the Bible tells us he will be indwelt by Satan himself. Well, there's one other way that he is referred to, and that is as the beast, the beast. But since that one is going to take a little time to develop, I think we'll save that one till next time. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is so specific. We don't have to guess about this stuff. We can know who the players will be in the end times. We can see your plan. We can know in advance, even before these things develop, and Lord, we don't know, perhaps in our own lifetime, we may be able to see some of these things take shape. 
But Lord, whether we see these things or not, we know that ultimately they will happen just as your word says. So Lord, help us to live in light of the confidence that we have, knowing that we have your truth. And Lord, help us to live for you this week in Jesus' name.